normally when we talk about robots, the image that comes to mind is something like this. Uh, machines that are very powerful, very quick, very accurate. They're good at drilling, welding, bending, all kinds of stuff. Very dangerous to be around. You don't meet them walking down the street. And they're usually locked away in a factory someplace, well out of sight. Well, these are very important part of our uh, world today, and they're going to continue to be an important part of our world. But there's something else happening in robotics, something that will change society forever. And we'll never interact with machines or never look at them the same way again. And these are social companion robots, humanoid robots. Just to give you an idea of uh, what's going on, this uh, face is a robotic face. It's called Jules. It's designed to empathize with other people. The face, it can move the eyebrows, the eyes, the lips can move, the, the nostrils can flare. All of that uh, movement is designed to express emotion. So robots uh, built with this technology will empathize with people. They will detect the emotions of the other person. They will know if they are happy, confused, if they are frustrated. They will be able to tune in to that person and empathize with them. And this will give them great powers of persuasion. Robots will have personality. They will have culture and charm. When you talk about uh, conversational robots, it's not just an issue of saying the words. Tonation, inflection is very important, timing, and also body language. Does the person pay attention? or Do they look interested, etc.? All of these things are very important uh, parts of communication. And what's happening now is that we're going beyond a situation where uh, machines communicate using facts and data, and they communicate using emotions and all the signals that, that humans emit that go beyond uh, what we're used to. This is something very different, and we're never going to interact with robots the same way again. I mentioned culture, personality, charm. Of course, this face, you could make another face. It could be Asian, it could be from Africa, Latin America, it could be an obviously Belgian face. Uh, when you put it on a robot, you can give it clothes, you can build the body any way you want. So robots of the future are going to distinguish themselves in terms of appearance. And they'll also distinguish themselves in terms of their, their character, their personality. We're not quite there yet. There's still a lot of research to be done. So let's have a look at where we are. While we're waiting for Jules, which uh, Jules is a working prototype, it's under development, it's not widely available right now, but it's an example of what's coming down the tracks, what's going to be amongst us, maybe looking over the hedge of a neighbor's garden in a couple of years' time. What can we do today? Well, these two guys, you might have seen them. Uh, this is a robot called Nao. It's made by a French company, Aldebaran. Uh, this guy can move around autonomously. He can walk around the room. If he runs out of power, he can charge himself. He can recognize his owner. It can uh, talk. It can listen. It recognizes simple commands. It can wave its arms and dance. There's all kinds of interesting things. In many ways, it's an ideal toy. And in fact, kids love it. But the vision, it's a little bit expensive for the moment. It's about the cost of a small car. Uh, the vision of the owners is that over the next few years, say within the next five years, the cost of this will be comparable to a laptop. And many people believe, uh, Bill Gates uh, writing about robotics years ago, I think in 2009, uh, he said that we'll probably one day have a robot in every home. In fact, some governments have already adopted this as an official strategy for their country, South Korea. They reckon that they'll have a robot in every home by 2020. Whether it will look exactly like this or, or not is another thing, but there is an incredible amount of technology packed into this. And one of the things that these guys are doing to make uh, the robot more accessible and more useful to everybody is to open up the software development for the robot. So in the same way that you buy a mobile phone and you download applications onto your mobile phone that give you a whole range of functionalities that the phone company never dreamt of, the same thing will happen for these humanoid robots. You will have uh, uh, a robot that is good with dogs. 
I mean, when we talk about humanoid robots, they're designed for interacting with humans. But actually, if you want to fit into a uh, normal social life, you're going to have to distinguish between older people, very young people, babies, teenagers, busy professionals. The way you interact with all of these people is very, very different. The way you interact with animals, the extended family, neighbors, friends, carers like doctors, people in authority, all of these things, somehow the robot has to learn. And it's going to be the job of software developers to provide the robot with these capabilities. Again, these uh, if you lined up 10 of those in the shop, they all look the same. You take them home, weeks later, their people have knitted clothes for them, they've given them names, they've done all kinds of things to personalize them and to make them part of the family. It really is extraordinary, uh, the ability of people to bond with machines. At the end of the day, we love our cars, we love our computer games, we love our phone. There's a lot that we love about the technology around us. And the relationship with, uh, with robots is even going to be stronger than that, basically because they are so useful, so convenient, and so able to fit into our lives and our lifestyle. This is, um, uh, this is a precursor to now, actually. It was, it's called the Wakamaru. It was made by Mitsubishi Heavy Industry. Hard to imagine a heavy engineering company <laughs> building something like this. Uh, if you look at it, it, again, it costs about the same as a small car. Um, it was made for families. The general, it found a market amongst people who were uh, interested in looking after elderly parents living on their own or living in the house who for periods were on their own. This is an issue that uh, is very important. We talk about a lot in Europe, but it's not just important in Europe. It's important in many countries. People live increasingly solitary lives. We move around a lot. The number of people who live on their own is increasing all the time. And in fact, society is getting older. One of the drivers of the uptake or the adoption of these, uh, these kind of humanoid robots is in fact the aging of society and the needs of older people. If you want to look after a grandparent, for example, well, one of the things you can do is you can ring them up quite often. But this is irritating. People often feel as though they're being followed. It's an imposition. If you ring them at the wrong time, they're annoyed because you've woken them during their nap. There's a lot that's difficult about keeping an eye on a person using the mobile phone. If they were in the same house as you, you could look in on them. You could just look around the corner, see that they were there, notice they were sleeping, see that everything was okay, and you'd be reassured. The way that you would interact and reassure yourself as to their safety is very different. And this actually is the way that some people use this Wakamaru robot. It's a way of keeping an eye on elderly people. It's still quite expensive. Uh, it's not as um, dexterous as now by this French company, uh, Aldebaran. But it works, and it found a market, and it's going to get better over time. When it's a warm day, one of the things that people need to do is drink water. Uh, simple things, reminding somebody to take a glass of water on a warm day can save their life. Reminding them to take their medicine prolongs their life. If you want to remind somebody to take medicine, you can say to them, listen, take your medicine. And if they ignore you, what do you do? Up the volume and repeat it, take your medicine. <laughs> uh, if you do this, you're probably you know, not going to get a, the response that you need. Uh, the way in which you communicate uh, requires a whole strategy that goes beyond merely providing the information. It's time to take your medicine. Uh, this is an area where the powers of persuasion of humanoid robotics are going to become increasingly important over time. Uh, important, increasingly important in, in, in the sense of their, their ability, the ability uh, to persuade. And they'll be used in areas like um, preventative health care, uh, convincing a person, persuading them, 
by the, a small word at the right time that they should eat something different, go for the fish instead of the meat, it's time for exercise. Uh, small things like that, this continuous uh, tactful intervention can have a huge impact on somebody's health. It's preventative healthcare. On the other hand, they could be used in marketing. These robots are also used uh, as greeting robots in fairs, in places like Japan. If you can persuade, why not persuade somebody to buy something? That's also a very interesting proposition. But because of these, the powers of persuasion that these new technologies are going to endow robots with, we're going to find ourselves in situations where the ethics or the morality of the situation will become increasingly important. Um, I mentioned Korea. There is an official policy in Korea that by 2020 there should be a robot in every home. Well, we don't have to wait till 2020. This robot is called Enki. It's an assistant teacher. It's already been trialed in, in schools in Korea. Uh, by the end of this year, 400 of them will be working as assistant teachers in schools. By the end of the year after, 8,000 will be installed in schools across Korea, mainly in kindergarten and uh, maternal schools. Now, what are they used for? <clears throat> I asked, uh, I met some of the scientists involved in this, and I asked them, you know, said, hey, this must have been really controversial, thinking that the teachers were on strike and they strongly objected to this. But that wasn't at all the case. Uh, I was told that it was controversial. Mainly, people wanted to know what will happen if it breaks down. You know, how are we going to get it back working again? These are being used to do things like um, teach social skills. Basically, they augment the capabilities of the teacher. They truly act as an assistant. Social skills means how to play, how to greet. Also, they're being used to teach uh, simple language instruction. Uh, there's a shortage of English teachers in Korea. And you know that Korea is one of the most advanced industrial economies in the world today. Their industry is highly globalized, but generally they feel their level of, of English and the ability to, uh, to communicate abroad is not as good as they would like it to be. So they're using robots to start English language instruction as early as possible. What's interesting about this is, you know, if you're dealing with older people, you have to be tactful, respectful. There is a protective element to the interaction of the robot and, and the person. The issue of, you know, what is the right thing to do in a situation is very important. When you're dealing with kids, you know, what's the right thing to do is still an issue. But here it's about what are the good habits to reinforce? What are the bad habits to discourage? How do you do that? There is an ethical or a moral dimension to much of what's going to happen, basically because of the power of this medium to influence its environment, to change behaviors, and to fit in with the way we live. These, the capabilities of these machines is going to continue improving for a long time. Uh, the earlier robots that you saw, the Wakamaru, it didn't have very dexterous hands. Now it was a bit more dexterous. This is an example of an arm made by a company called Kinova of Canada. Uh, recently, I also saw one made by the Fraunhofer in Germany. Uh, they were manipulating eggs. They were able to go open the fridge, take some eggs out of the carton, etc., bring them over to the kitchen. The, the physical ability of robots is really improving at an extraordinary pace. And as they are able to do more, we will ask them to do more simply because they're able and it's very convenient. We don't have to program them. We ask them simply. We say, could you get a beer from the fridge? And the robot will get a beer from the fridge, bring it over, put it in front of me. I'll ask it to open it. It'll open it. Or maybe it will say, listen, you've already had five beers. Maybe haven't you had enough? You know, this uh, issue of what is correct is, is, is going to become a, a super layer of the ability of the robot. Maybe in their actions, they will start refusing some of our requests. If two people, one person asks the robot to get a beer, and then you know, I ask my robot to get me a beer, and somebody, my mother, my wife, whatever, comes along, and she says, no, no, you've had enough, what's the robot to do? We have a serious moral dilemma here. I might get jealous or angry. I might say, who the hell are you working for anyway? Who paid for you? Who filled you up with silicon grease every now and then? <laughs> so these are, are issues that are, you know, they're not 
issues that would be identified by philosophers as major ethical issues because they're trivial or intuitive to us. But yet, if they were to happen in uh, our everyday lives, uh, in our relations with other people, they might lead to arguments, they might lead to fights. But these are things that we're going to have to grapple with in the very near future. Machines will learn about their environment. They learn about our habits. They learn how to live with this. Somebody said it's a bit like riding a horse. The horse has to learn you, and you have to learn the horse. And eventually, you become a good couple. But this is going to happen with robots. One day, the day you see uh, two people asking a machine, say, get me a beer, and somebody else says no, the day that robot hesitates, that's the day when you will know that we have entered the age of moral machines. <laughs>